For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. It's good to see you all this morning. It's good to be here in God's house. We don't know how many more Sabbaths we'll be able to meet like this, but uh, each one that passes brings us closer to the last one before we're all scattered to who knows where. But if we've given our lives to Jesus, wherever we're scattered, wherever we finish up, He'll never lead, to a, lead us to a place where He hasn't gone before us and isn't already there. So, desperate heart, you don't need me to tell you that the Word of God gives us many uh, very serious, needful admonitions, and uh, this morning I'm going to give an admonition, as it were, from the Word of God, which is in Proverbs 4, verse 23. I'm going to read from the King James, and also I'm going to read it also from the NIV. And it says this, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And again from the NIV, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And that is true. You know why it's true? Because God just said it. God says, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life, for out of it is the wellspring of life. Every action that somebody does, whether good or bad, it was first generated right in here, in the heart. Actually, it's in the mind, but nonetheless, you know what I'm talking about. So, a well can bring forth good water or contaminated water, and a heart is no different. It depends who's in charge of the well. That's the important thing. So we're talking about hearts this morning, so I'd like us to have a serious heart-to-heart -heart about our hearts in the presence of God today. And there's two things about human hearts, fallen human hearts, that we will look at this morning. One is this, our own hearts will deceive us into sin, and those same hearts will also harden us in sin. That one heart can do two things and cause an awful lot of damage. Jeremiah 17, 9, which was our Scripture reading this morning, we read, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What does it mean to be desperate? It means to be desperate means you're desperate, right? <laughs> Desperado. You know, um, the heart is desperately deceitful, but you don't hear it crying out very often with this desperation, I want to deceive you. No, it doesn't do that. It has a way of keeping calm, keeping very rational, keeping quiet, keeping its intents and intentions under the radar so we may not always understand just what it's getting up to. We don't know our own hearts, and I'm talking about this this morning. I went online and I looked up one of those good old free dictionaries. I put deceitful. The heart is deceitful of all things, and this is what I got. The act or practice of deceiving, right? So, a deceitful heart is a deceiving heart. It says concealment 
or distortion of the truth for the purpose of misleading, dup duplicity, fraud, cheating. And I added trickery. See, the heart is very smart at being very, very cunning, devising ways of doing things, malignant things which are harmful to other people. And we know all our hearts are capable of doing this. And if your heart is like mine, I must confess, in the past, I've done that. I've been a wicked little guy sometimes. And I still have that potential. But it goes deeper, this business of having a deceptive heart. Yes, we may have hearts that may, may, con may conceal uh, hidden purposes to harm somebody else. But you know, our hearts are so deceptive, so smart in a wrong way, that our hearts can even deceive us. And that's especially where I want us to go uh, this morning. Our own hearts can lead us into doing many things, even good things. We may on the surface be a very magnanimous person, very kind, very generous. We may give, as Paul said, I may give my body to be burned. He says, I may bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And there are people in life who do those very things. And we may be motivated ourselves from the heart to do those same things. And people look at us as we may be burned at the stake or we finish up destitute because we've given everything away. And people say, oh, what a kind, generous person that is. And that same kind, generous person may have done that very thing from a heart that outwardly looked very kind, but inside it was proud and vain and it wanted a good name. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. People go to great distances in, uh, in generosity and, and um, kindness and charity just to have people say, you are so kind. So what is the motive? It can be pride and vanity, a love for display and to be praised. That's just one example of what the human heart can do. There is a way, it tells us in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, to a woman, to a child. Seems right, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. So if anybody doubts what I'm uh, talking about this morning, let us never forget this. Lucifer was misled by his own heart when he was still in an unfallen state. Lucifer was misled and deceived by his own heart when he was still in an unfallen state. It finally became sin, but not at first. And I'll, I'll read you something in a moment so you can understand that. You know, in Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, it speaks of Satan. It says, I will be, I will be like the Most High. It says, I will, I will I plant my throne upon the, uh, I will ascend above the stars. I will be like the Most High. You're familiar with that verse and also Ezekiel chapter 28. I don't have time to read them, but you're familiar with them, I hope. Well, I'm going to read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 39. And this is from the chapter right at the beginning, Why Was Sin Permitted? And if so many people out there understood this, this world would make so much more sense. But anyway, we know how Satan began entertaining these inflated ideas about himself. And God could see this. And so God took him aside to try and help him out. And this is what we read on page 39. In great mercy, according to his divine character, God bore long with Lucifer. The spirit of discontent and disaffection had never before been known in heaven. It was a new element, strange, mysterious, unaccountable. Saint Lucifer himself had not at first been acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. So even he didn't understand fully what was going on, these inflated ideas about wanting to be like God. And God didn't blot him out of existence because at this point he didn't understand this. It was a totally new experience for any created being. So at that point it wasn't a sin. But God saw the danger nonetheless. 
For a time he had feared to express the workings and imaginings of his mind, yet he did not dismiss them. He did not see, he did not see, he didn't, didn't quite get it, you see. He did not see whither he was drifting. But such efforts as infinite love and wisdom only could devise were made to convince him of his error. His disaffection was proved to be without cause, and he was made to see. So at first it says he didn't see, but God labored with him, counseled him, and then it says he was made to see, and also made to see what, be, what would be the result of persisting in revolt. Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. He saw, third time, we speak about seeing here. He saw that the Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works, that the divine statutes are just and that He ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Had He done this, He might have saved Himself and many angels. He had not at this point fully come to cast off His allegiance to God. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet he, if he had been willing to return to God, acknowledging the Creator's wisdom and satisfied to fill the place appointed him in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. So it wasn't too late. But it says this, the time had come for a final decision. A what kind of a decision? Final decision decision. He must fully yield to the divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion. Now, there's a process here. I'd like us to follow it because this is how God works with us. And I've already kind of mentioned this. First of all, first step in the process, he didn't see, okay? But then he was made to see that God's way was right, and finally, he was made to see, sorry, he was made to see that his way was wrong. Then he was made to see that God's way was right. Three steps, okay, thus far. After that third step, there was no further any excuse for continuing his wrong behavior. So the fourth step came, and that was decision time. Final opportunity now, are you in or are you out? fifth step. What was it? Well, let me read it. Tragic. We read, he nearly reached the decision to return. Nearly reached the decision to return. But he obviously didn't. Why not? God had told him, showed him, he saw it clearly that he was wrong. He saw that God was right. In his mind, he almost made a decision to return, but he didn't. It says, pride forbade him. Where was that pride cherished? Inside that heart, right? Inside that heart. So those two things happened. First of all, his heart deceived him into, wasn't quite sin originally, but his heart finally deceived him into sin. And when the final decision came and he refused, then his heart hardened him in sin. And after that point on, God could do nothing more for him. It says it was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error that his imaginings were false, and to yield to the authority which he had been working to prove unjust. That's what his heart did for him. Didn't have to be so, but the only safety we have is keeping our hearts in God's care if we don't want to follow in Lucifer's footsteps. So if it was and if it's still necessary for unfallen angels to understand the working of their own hearts, how much more necessary is it for us fallen human beings to understand the working of our own hearts, right? Our prayer should be, Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That should be our prayer among our other elements in our prayer life every single day. I didn't intend to read so much, but you know, there are some good things in the spirit of prophecy, so I'm going to read them this morning. There is a chapter in volume 6 called The Testing Process. Just going to read a few bits from one paragraph, but I suggest uh, Testimonies, volume 4, pages uh, 83 to 94. Make a note of that and go home and read it, The Testing Process. This is what we read here, page 85. Uh, to men to women, to all of us. Uh, let me put it this way. To those whom God designs, to those whom God designs shall fill responsible positions, He in mercy reveals their hidden defects that they may look within and examine critically the complicated emotions and exercises of their own hearts to detect that which is wrong. To look inside, to examine the complicated emotions of their own hearts. A little further down, it says here that, they, that their real motives might be revealed. And again, it says, God would have, in, have His servants become acquainted with the moral machinery of their own hearts. you got moral machinery working inside you. And if it's moral machinery... Working for God, praise the Lord, but it can become immoral machinery. And, we may, and that may function below the radar, and we may not fully understand the true spiritual condition or shape of our hearts. And when a crisis comes along, boom, suddenly we find out. I, I'm going to move on from that because I have other things to read here this morning. So we need to understand the moral machinery of our hearts. So we need to pray that prayer, Lord, search me, know me, try my heart, speak to me from your word, through the promptings of your spirit, through the circumstances of life. Show me, Lord. Now, Peter was a good example of somebody whose heart deceived him into sin. Because Peter, before that crisis in Gethsemane, hadn't critically examined the complicated emotions and exercises of his own heart. He had not, to quote again, become acquainted with the moral machinery of his own heart. Therefore, it was in an hour that he did not expect it at all that he finished up cursing Jesus in the court of Caiaphas. And this seems so ironic when you consider that just a short time before that same evening, that same night, Jesus had drawn, a, I mean, Peter had drawn a sword in Gethsemane. He was ready to fight for Jesus right there in the garden, but quite a flip-flop, right? Quite a flip-flop. So we might well ask, how come? One minute he's there drawing a sword ready to die. For Jesus, in the next minute, is a coward, and he's denying him. How come? What changed the tide in Peter's life, in Peter's heart? Well, I mentioned this in Sabbath school two or three weeks ago. I said, a principle came into play. A principle came into play that gave a stunning, very stunning revelation of the real Peter. And that principle is this, and you've heard this before, crisis reveals character. What reveals character? Crisis. Crisis reveals character. And the crisis of Christ's betrayal raised the curtain on Peter's true spiritual condition. Now, Jesus knew what the real Peter was like inside. And that same very night, Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him, which he did, and it was a painful lesson for him to learn. And it's one he never forgot, but that same night in the upper room, 
Peter said to Jesus, and I'm reading from Matthew 26, verses 33, 34, and 35. Peter said in the upper room, he said, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And Jesus came straight back, and he said, Verily. And when Jesus says, Verily, you need to listen, because he's trying to make a point here. And he says, Peter, Verily. I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter comes back again. He said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. But he did, right? He sure did. So what could Peter have done to, if you like, rearrange the moral machinery of his heart and have it well oiled through the Spirit so that he would not have done this thing. What could he have done so he wouldn't have denied Jesus? Well, Jesus gave um, prescribed uh, a preventive measure in that same chapter, Matthew 26, verse 41. Jesus said this, Watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus gave a very practical, preventative measure. He said, Peter, and he was speaking to all the disciples, he said, pray. Nothing magical about that, is there? Just practical thing, pray. Yet, how often, it may be too simplistic that maybe uh, you're not getting the point, some of you, but how often do we wait for temptations to come or crises to hit in our lives, then we fall upon our knees and we start to pray? Well, it's always good to pray, but you know, the best preventive measure so you can be ready, so that the moral machinery of your heart is ready to meet with the temptation of the crisis, is to pray before the crisis strikes, right? Doesn't it make sense? And this is what Jesus said. He knew the crisis was coming. They didn't. So He says, pray. And He could already see. He said, indeed, the Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, that good old, well, it's not good old, it's rotten old fallen flesh trick you every time. You see, the heart will work through the fallen flesh. So the very time Peter and the others should have been alert and praying was the very time that they succumbed to this numbing stupor, this state of mind. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, with the greatest crisis before them, they went to sleep. Desire of Ages 688, we read this. And there's a lesson here for us all. They had prayed. At first they'd prayed a little bit. It says they had prayed as they heard the strong cries of the sufferer. That was Jesus a little further over in the garden. They heard him praying with such an intensity. And so they prayed for a while, but they, they did not intend to forsake their Lord. But they seemed paralyzed by a stupor which they might have shaken off had they continued pleading with God. They did not realize the necessity of watchfulness and earnest prayer in order to resist temptation. Oh, what a scenario that was. We, we are on the verge of the greatest crisis that has ever hit this world since the flood. We are God's church. We are on the verge of a crisis that is going to hit us in many ways far harder than a lot of other people out there. Their crisis has really come, but for God to have us ready to find us on the right side, to be able to seal us and give us the, the latter rain, to seal us with the seal of God, our crisis to be prepared to do that is going to come first. And the Satan, Satan has got many inventions, many ways that he can use to, to ply off, to give to us, to palm off to us, so that we, as it were, in our Gethsemane, when we should be praying for preparation, a stupor comes upon us. Can you think of anything in your life that, in a sense, symbolically or literally brings a stupor over your mind so that when you should be praying, you just feel, duh, blah, I know I should. 
but oh, I want to go to sleep so bad. Or just watch one more post on Facebook. Right? I always give Facebook a hammering, don't I? Facebook's all right. I'm on Facebook. But you know what? I've learned. I have to ration it. I've learned. I can get sucked in. So when that time comes, put that iPad down. Put the elastic thing around. Put it down. That will blow your mind like nothing else can tell it. You name it. You name it. Anyway, I'll leave it there. But you examine your life and see what things are in there which take the sharp edge of your spiritual discernment or just take away your relish and your hunger and thirst to seek God, to read His Word, to seek Him in prayer. Ellen White, in I think it's Christ's Object Lesson, she speaks of those who, when they're praying, and she says there's very few. She says they pray till every power is on the stretch. Have you prayed recently till every power is on the stretch? And you have an earnestness that storms heaven with a spiritual violence. And you are so earnest that you want the blessings of God, either for wisdom or strength or the ability to overcome. Maybe God is calling you in some way to go out. And I've used this illustration before. At midnight, when nobody can see you, when it's dark, leave a book on a door and then run for your life. Do that at least. <laughs> Can't you do that at least? And so, uh, if they'd prayed, you see, getting back to Gethsemane, they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have yielded to that temptation. They would have prayed. But they did. And what was the temptation that they yielded to? Matthew 26, 5. Uh, tw Matthew 26, verse 56. It says, after Jesus was arrested, it says, Then, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. That was the temptation. Let's get out of here when they should have stood firm. That was a time to be a champion when champions are few. But they became cowards. Praise God, they had a chance later on to be champions, and they were. But they, they too learned a hard lesson from this. But Peter's fall was even lower uh, that night. So glad you're able to join us for part one of Desperate Heart. Pastor Mike Thompson is talking to us today about how desperately wicked and evil the natural heart is. But it doesn't end there. There is hope. There's someone who can change our hearts. And we're going to talk more about that in part two of this presentation. So we look forward to seeing you next week. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.